This recording may be used for training purposes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I totally was off track as far as time, but now I'm realizing that's a perfect that's a perfect start to the conversation about well, time in general. <laughs> it's it's okay, worked out fine. Um, yeah. I think because in the process of switching from email to signal, we got confused somehow. Does that make well, sense? Yeah, it's pretty cool. I've, ne I've never, uh, never used that, and uh, it's easy. Okay. So, what's on your mind, Jacob? Um. A lot, <laughs> uh, a lot about, uh, I've been uh, researching a lot about dependent origination on your channel and a bunch of other stuff that I thought was kind of confidential that you just put it right out there um, that I've never heard anybody talk about like uh, the matrica, like the letters and numbers, um, like the stuff that was in Lakshmi Tantra. Uh, I didn't know it was so easy to figure out these things. And so as far as like dependent origination, uh, I just was not getting the whole idea of the fabrications, um, Sankara. And I had a real big insight into um, Sankara, which is, um, like a more firsthand experience of like the idea of timelessness wasn't just an idea. Timelessness was a thing. Um, and that is, it's, well, it's actually not disconcerting at all. It's actually more uh, odd that, uh, I don't know, that time is the way that people told me it was. That's, that seems more odd to me somewhat now than, uh, than it was before. Um, uh, in your series about timelessness and eternalism, uh, you talked a little bit about that, and that goes uh, in the whole subject of uh, uh, dependent origination. But yeah, Sankara, so many things are Sankaras that I did not suspect. Well, money is one of them, um, a big one. Uh, tomorrow, yesterday, to a degree. I guess yesterday's happened, but my idea about yesterday is kind of a, as, as far as like a memory, right? That's more or less a Sankara. That's, that's my view uh, now. Um, yeah, I'm kind of an odd case because I'm, I'm an experimenter. I'm an ex experimenter as far as, the, the, as drugs are concerned. Um, and uh, use of sacred plants and all that kind of thing. And uh, I was like, in my, I guess, more youth, I was more like, uh, like an experimenter in those days. And then later, I figured out how to actually integrate it into spirituality. And I found that um, a lot of your videos on your channel if I really had a good, uh, like you, like you say, ontology, I guess you would say, of like a map of things, you could have, you could lead things uh, in a certain way, and interesting things can happen. That uh, because it it is no longer a drug experience, and it changes into a, it changes into something completely different. I don't know if you would agree with that, but um, yeah, like if you say smoke some pot, that is is what it is. It's like taking uh, alcohol or something or anything else. 
Uh, but with these sacred plants, if you take them in the right mindset, in the right, I guess, with, yeah, with the right map, like I was saying, um, interesting things can happen. And so uh, in, that, uh, in that vein, I took the, the sacred mushrooms. Oh, no. And uh, next thing you know, some hours later, and it didn't feel like hours, when I woke up from everything, uh, it felt like only minutes had passed. And uh, uh, that's, that could be timelessness too. But um, during the whole experience, I went through a lot of, a lot of places. Uh, the most important part was seeing, I guess, I don't know if, because as far as dependent origination goes, it's the, this primordial ignorance and fabrication consciousness and so on and so on and uh so i'm not sure i like as far as ignorance seeing ignorance fall away like what would that be i don't remember any particular aha moment but i remember the aha moment as far as sankara uh was just seeing so many things in my life I wouldn't say, uh, maybe you could say didn't have any significance whatsoever or just it wasn't completely not real. Just so unreal. And uh, later on, just having this experience of just being. And you always hear about people like Zen guys or like, yeah, just sitting. And... Uh, uh, well, I was just sitting there, <laughs> and uh, uh, coming out coming out of things. I guess uh, questions I would have, uh, not really questions, but like, uh, well, I guess my questions would be having to do with. Okay, say you take away that primordial ignorance, and now the sankara can fall away. And then, um, so you talked a little bit about like vortex theory and all that, and like how consciousness and name and form are like a uh, vortex. And so the consciousness begets the name and form and the name and form kind of interacts with each other and neither the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. I guess you could say. Um, and so I was wondering, like, well, I know now that life is back to normal. <laughs> life is very back to normal the way it was. But having looked at that and been like, and seeing this stuff fall away is, uh, was very fun and very liberating experience. I probably won't do that, that again. <laughs> it was not my expectation going into it, but that was my, was my question going into it. I kind of had a question. I said, um, goddess, tell me about dependent origination. <laughs> I literally said that. And uh, I learned some things. I came out with a lot of questions and some answers to do with Sankara and a better understanding. But as uh, far as the other ones, they seem pretty pretty obvious. Um, and my understanding of the, the Eightfold Path is uh, a little murky. Uh, but yeah, I don't have, I, I guess I could tell like my story in more detail, like uh, how I came to, uh, uh, to your channel. Uh, is I was just sitting there and I Googled Kala Tantra because I was hanging out with these guys uh, in my city that were like a Kala Tantra group and they were teaching about all that. And I was like, I wonder if anybody else uh, in, the, in the world uh, is talking about this or, or what, what's, what, what's with it. And I found your channel and I was so glad I found it, but also at the same time, I was a little mad at myself because I was like, 
this started eight years ago? Are you telling me that's true? No way. Because I wish I had that eight years ago. Um, but yeah, sorry if I'm just going on and on. <laughs> And uh, another one of my big interests in, in looking into your channel was, and it totally blew my mind, I started watching your channel about maybe a year ago. And uh, right around that time, you were getting tons of videos about Tree Vidya. And that was one of these mysteries to me. Uh, I had a, a, another teacher who told me a lot of things, but didn't tell me where to find out about these things. <laughs> he just told me, uh, gave me certain techniques and said, oh yeah, you might want to find out about um, the letters and numbers in Sanskrit. You might want to find out about numerology. Uh, you might want to find out about these things. And I, uh, the thing I like about your channel so much is you go to the original scriptures. And that's something I never got. <laughs> Everybody's got their little spin on things all the time. Uh, another one of the uh, talks you had um, with one of your viewers, he said something so um, so interesting. At least it was interesting to me is how people seem like, at least in spiritual life and also in, in everything else, like it's it's like somebody else is running the show. So like as far as their ideas and whatever, it's like uh, it's they're they're kind of derivative. He, he said something to that effect. It was, a, it was like a 30-minute 30, 30 talk. So it's one little bit of it. But I thought that was so um, true. And true for me, uh, the more I get into more authentic um, spiritual life and more with the original scriptures, the more I figure out that how corrupted my ideas have been <laughs> by like all the BS. And like most of the most of the stuff like um, here where I live um, in the states is like a hokey new age um, BS uh, in large large part. And uh, but there's there's some here and there that might tell you something, and that something led me to wanting to learn about the whole Sri Vidya thing. And that's how I ended up with, at your channel. Anyway. <laughs> so what's up? <laughs> well, this is great. I don't have to do anything. You're, you're making the whole video. <laughs> it's like, I could just sit back. Well, where's my green tea? Okay, yeah, excellent. <laughs> well, let's uh, take a look at the threefold ignorance. Tritiya Vidya. Um, the threefold ignorance has a structure, and it's composed of things you like, things you don't like, and the delusion that you're an individual. Those are the three parts of the threefold ignorance. And if you look into it, you can see, actually, these are simply judgments simply thoughts. Why do some people like, for example, one flavor of ice cream and another doesn't like that? See, to the yeah. first person, it's pleasurable. To the second, it's unpleasurable, displeasurable. And then on top of that, there's the delusion that I can choose my flavor of ice cream. I have agency. I have individuality. I am at cause over things. This is a complete delusion. Uh, Ramana Maharshi always said, our fate 
is decided not by ourselves, but by karma. That means things that we did in previous lives. So the whole concept of the empirical self, the individual self, the ego, is completely imaginary. It's, Buddha calls it a delusion. He says everybody is basically insane. Oh, yeah, the, the inmates are running the asylum. <laughs> exactly. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> so then from there, we make up all kinds of desires. That's sankara. Now, sankara, it's actually shankara, it's plural. Uh, shankara are translated very differently by different uh, translators. I like uh, fabrications because it emphasizes the made up nature of the Sankara. Um, some people call them preparations, conditions, foundations, or even choices. Promises, even? Choices. I was, choices, yeah. So depending on who you read, you can have a very, very different idea of what Sankara are. But I mean, it's very simple. I, I think we did, we did a whole series on it a while back when I was staying at a Buddhist monastery two or three years ago. And um, basically, Sankara are the dreams that you make up regarding your preferences in the ignorance stage. Uh, I like vanilla ice cream. I hate chocolate ice cream. So I want lots of vanilla ice cream. I don't even want to see any chocolate ice cream. Those are Sankara based on your preferences, likes and dislikes and the idea that you're an individual and you can make choices. But whether you get vanilla or chocolate is not up to you. It's determined by your karma. So look what happens. You're at a party and the hostess brings you a big, nice big bowl of chocolate ice cream. And you go, ew, you're suffering. You're suffering because you have this sankara that I don't like chocolate ice cream. I want vanilla. Right? Maybe you get into an argument. <laughs> Why did you bring me chocolate? You know I like vanilla. And so on and so on. So all this suffering that we experience and actually all the enjoyment that we experience are both illusory. That's the hard part. Here we go with the enjoyment part. <laughs> that's, it's that's not about part. giving up the enjoyment. It's about giving up the identification and the attachment. The idea that you have this agency, that you can decide that these preferences are meaningful. And, and becoming attached to them and the mind forming rigid structures around them. And then of course, there's going to be inevitable conflict with others. And, you know, so many things are going to happen that you don't like, don't want, wish yeah. would, they would go away. See? And of course, the biggest one is death. 
Yeah. We, we did a, a very uncomfortable subject. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're born, so you have to die. Yeah. That's really all you need to know about it. It's going to happen. So now your attitudes about death shape a great deal of your approach to life. Like um, um, the existentialists talk a lot about fear of death. And they say, well, why should you fear death when death is that which is most your own? Just like nobody can live your life, nobody can die your death. See? It's the most intimate moment you could have with, I guess, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> the most private, most intimate, most personal, most individual thing that can happen to you. So, of course, the reason we fear death is that we are attached to life. The hope that we're going to get some of the things that we want in the future, that desire. So we're conditioned by our desire. And then because we don't want to confront death in any meaningful way, but that still doesn't take away the anxiety, the fear of death. And so we project that fear on all kinds of things around us. And, and this is another psychological mechanism behind conspiracy theories and paranoia in general, you know, hey. a lot of the way that people are. What? Uh, they. Oh, they're doing it. Um, yeah, yeah, they. Yeah. They, right. <laughs> The ubiquitous they, yeah. right? they controlling everything. Uh, and people would rather have that fear than confront the actual fear of death. They still, I mean, they even admit, well, they can't do anything about it, you know? If the uh, government is putting nanobots in the vaccines or whatever, whatever crazy thing, you know, we lost a lot of subscribers over that. Because you, because you said, hey, uh, it's, it, I took the vaccine and I was okay. I'm it's, fine. Uh, it's like, that's all you said. You didn't say do it or don't. You, or you didn't say force but, everyone or anything but weird. Because I labeled it a delusion. Conspiracy yeah. theories in general. Huh? And people don't like that. And I, I even have several, I've lost several friends over it. it it's crazy. The, it's, it's really, I guess, uh, I don't know. It's some kind of weird selection that shouldn't even be. It should, shouldn't be someone's opinion on such a stupid subject should make or break it. <laughs> I mean, when I was a kid, I had chicken pox, measles, um, rubella, um, we're gonna have a couple other weird diseases that basically don't exist anymore because of vaccines. Yeah, polio, on and on. <laughs> yeah, I got, pol I got the polio vaccine. I didn't get polio. No ill effects at all. So, you know, you know, I, I don't want to accuse anybody of being crazy, but they are. <laughs> because why? They're projecting a specific fear, the fear of death, and generalizing it. You know, um, th there's a saying, it's not paranoia if they really are out to get you. <laughs> yeah. But... You know, the poor people in the government, they're just as clueless and confused and overwhelmed and full of anxiety and uncertainty as anybody else. That's just the human condition. It applies to everyone. So it's not like there's somebody, you know, in a room full of, of video screens 
connected to surveillance cameras that are injected into people's bloodstream or some darn thing. It, it, it does not exist. It can't. So there are really no controllers in the material world except nature herself, the goddess. She is controlling by creating the laws of the material world and everything happens within those laws. And human beings are just, you know, monkeys with big egos rattling around their cage, you know, and, and playing all these games. Um, I, it's sad, but that's why I do these videos. That's one reason why I do these videos. I see how people are so confused and so lost, you know, that uh, they need to hear the straight stuff, not any interpretation of it. Although I'm sure I can't help injecting my own biases into the uh, videos. I try to keep it to a minimum by presenting as far as possible straight from the scriptures and giving people access, you know, links to downloads and stuff like that. They can go read it for themselves. If they don't like what I make of it, how I explain it, go right to the source. Make up your own mind. But people don't want to make up their minds. They just want to take whatever some authority says and copy that opinion and claim it as their own. Even though they don't have the data, they haven't gone through the, they haven't thought through the whole issue or used reason or any tests like Occam's razor or, you know, any of those logical things to, to try to eradicate the fallacies in their interpretations. So the sankharas and the ignorance behind the sankharas remains unchallenged, uncriticized, unanalyzed in most people. And this is the tragic part. And if you try to take it away from someone, they would clutch at it and be like, no, no, oh, my illusions. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't make my day now. Come on. Yeah, exactly. They might want to fight you, too. Oh, yeah. So many things are, are absolutely, it becomes a war very quickly. <laughs> I mean, look what's happening in the States with all these demonstrations. People driving SUVs into demonstrations. That's nuts. I'm sorry. You know, they think they're justified because, you know, well, so many other people agree or whatever. I don't know what they think, actually. <laughs> I'm sure nine out of 10 doctors recommend Paul Malls as well. But I'm yeah, saying. right. <laughs> LSMFT, right? Maybe you're too young for LSMFT. No, I don't remember that. <laughs> Lucky strikes mean fine tobacco. Oh, okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter how fine it is, it still gives you cancer. Yeah. So these are the delusions, the these cons conspiracies theories, and all these different thoughts that are manufactured, mass produced by the sociopaths at the top of the social pyramid, and then distributed through the media and for and people just accept them because. They give a rationalization for the fear that they feel, the anxiety that they feel, without having to confront the actual source. I get what you're saying. You're saying, like, think for yourself, actually. That's all you're saying. Like, um, don't say that you're thinking for yourself, and really you're just parroting some, someone else. And... There's so many agendas on every end of whatever spectrum there is, whatever you want to call it. And even your own agenda, question that and all that. Yeah. I do regularly. Yeah. You notice there are times when I don't make very many videos. And it's because I'm, I'm looking into, you know, what am I trying to do here? You know, for a long time, 
in the beginning, I wanted influence. I wanted to be an influencer. <laughs> but then I realized, no, that's the wrong approach because then if only a few people show up, I'm going to be disappointed. Or if, if people don't really adopt these ideas, I'm going to feel, you know, somehow something wrong with that. I noticed but, that you don't want people to be a little exact copy of you. Heck you actually no. don't want that. You want no. people to make it your own. Right. <laughs> these are just suggestions, you know, these are just views. And you're free to try them out, you know. If they work for you, great. If they don't, move on to something else. You know, I'm talking from my experience, basically. I'm talking from my heart. Yeah, there's a lot of ideas involved. You know, there's a lot of language, specialized terminology, and ontology, and all that good stuff. But fundamentally, this is about my journey and the stages I've been through, which coincidentally happen to match what's in the scriptures. <laughs> and, I like that. It's very autobiographical. And it's like, if, it, if, if this helps you, great. Like inject it into whatever you're, you're doing already. Plug and play a little bit. Yeah, try it. You yeah, know? Try it. If, if it works for you, then go to the source and get the full picture, you know, from the source, from the original. Don't rely on my interpretation or anybody's interpretation. Because the, the original scriptures are the only ones, sources, without any bias. Because they're, they're not going to get anything from you. They don't want anything from you. See? It's just like, I'm so glad that I took care of myself financially so that now I don't have to charge for this. I'm, a, I'm retired. I have a pension. And I'm okay. I have enough to live in a country like India or Sri Lanka or Nepal or Thailand, you know. And uh, I don't have to worry about money. I don't have to bug people, you know, go to my Patreon or send me a donation or whatever. And uh, that allows me a great deal of freedom because now I'm not dependent on their opinions, whether they like what I'm doing or they don't like what I'm doing. You notice I'm probably one of the few people doing a lot of videos on YouTube that never does the subscribe and click the little bell and you know i think that's tacky i think that's tasteless if you're yeah. really interested you're going to subscribe absolutely you want the notification it has to come from you so i'm making the space for people to be individuals you know to be who they are not to be clones of me. In fact, if anybody starts parroting me, I get very suspicious. <laughs> Is this guy for real? Is this guy really sincere or what? You know? Interesting. And what he's thinking is, or she is like, oh, I bet I'm so impressive. I can rattle off uh, uh, things at the Quick speed, I can memorize things. Um, well, that's yeah. the funny thing. <laughs> there aren't very many people like that because I'm presenting on such a high level. It's not easy to understand. And uh, anybody just trying to parrot or, or memorize will be exposed very quickly because, you know, they're not really thinking for themselves. All it takes is one question <laughs> they're not ready for. <laughs> I was going to bring this up too, that so many teachers seem to be the same way as everyone else sells ideas, selling like, I don't uh, selling a certain thing. And there's certain little interpretation. You're talking about interpretations. Um, and so many teachers want you to be 
a little copy of that, like uh, little robots and just think and salute the flag and uh, don't really think about it and just, um, you know, like gain repetition, I guess, to some degree. And I don't, I don't really get that from you. I get, I get that you want people to make everything your, everything that you're presenting their own and own it, right? Uh, and think with it as, and then use that to springboard. I guess I was going to talk uh, one point about like retroduction, like the whole idea of because uh, because thinking is not the end goal. <laughs> Like you, uh, uh, one of your videos I was watch watching recently was like the ego of the sadaka. It was talking about, uh, yeah, you're building up all this stuff and learning all this stuff, but that's not the end goal to to build up a lot of stuff and learn a lot of stuff. That's something that needs to be overcome as well. It's a stage. You have to learn the map at least. You know, we always put up the chart with the four states of consciousness, the four yogas and so on and so on, the chakras and whatever, four views. And that's a map. And if you do the lowest stage, karma yoga stage, honestly, the successively higher states will manifest all by themselves spontaneous. At that point, there's no more need for book learning. The practice itself will bring you all the rest of the way. Do you ever feel like people are a little scared? Like, it's almost like they don't want to, they don't want to look, even though when they look, it's going to be so beautiful, just and the most intimate thing, just like death is. And, uh, you know what I mean? But they're afraid. <laughs> like, uh, they want, they want, they want, like, that's why these teachers, you know, try to clone themselves because they want just a mask that they can put on. They don't really want to change inside. They want a, a teacher ego. Oh, I'm a follower of so and so. In Tear of Anomaly, it's really, I mean, extreme. You have these little cliques, you know, Muji's followers and Osho's followers and so-and-so's followers and the other guy's followers, and they don't talk to each other at all. And if you try to they make... Did. They did. expose each other. They'd be like, you're a fraud. No, you're a fraud. It would come That's to That's what happens. Yeah. They just argue. They you know. But the point is, if you try to make friends with any of them, as soon as there's any kind of basic friendship established, they try to recruit you. And I'm like, you know, I already have enough gurus. Thank you very much. You know, I don't need another guru. I just want to be your friend. OK, no, you have to be a member of my group or I don't want to talk to you. And they they ghost me. And if I see them like on the street or in the shops or something, they glare at me, you know, it's weird. So that's, that's nuts. Huh? That's nuts. That's it's culty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's cultism. And, and I don't like it. I don't want to be part of it. I've been there. I've done that. I got the scars to prove it. And I'm not doing it again. I deserve better than that. Thank you. I want some real friends, not just because they we all belong to the same group or even even my group. I don't want to have a group. I don't want to make an organization because it uh, conditions people to this kind of cultishness or this cliqueishness. You know, being a clone of somebody. Yeah. And see, when I when I did have a small group. And after a few years, you know, we're starting to get established somewhere. And then I moved beyond that. They couldn't handle it. They freaked out. They destroyed, they, the students themselves destroyed the group. And then they created a huge scandal. 
and you know they they uh, what's that called the, when you stalk somebody online and then you know make negative comments about them on social media and stuff like that. For it, about that's five, a plug and play. That's yeah. the smear campaign thing and all that. That that's what these guys who are really psycho and nuts know how to do this to a scientific point that's like it's they should teach classes on it but they yeah, don't sociopaths have yeah it's sociopathic and and part of being a sociopath is to accuse other people of being a sociopath so that you don't have to take the heat <laughs> it's yeah, just that's a, a game that's a thing accuse the opponent of what you yourself are doing <laughs> projection yeah, yeah. So like, that's even a thing in law, like uh, like legal battles will will try to like. Anyway, there's all kinds of people that do dirty tricks, and that's dirty. That's that's all part of the dirty tricks book, you know. Have, have you ever read Machiavelli, The Prince? No, I guess I'm too afraid to. Well, <laughs> but, you've ever if you've ever heard of every trick in the book, that's, that's the book. The book, <laughs> right, right, and this. Uh, this Gervais principle that I've done a couple of videos on recently by Venkatesh Rao. This is another one of the, the book. It's the book about how to run a contemporary organization. That's what it's written towards? It's written with that in mind? Absolutely. You you're a manager Absolutely. so that you could, wow. Yep, it's a handbook. Like I, I know I've been I've been at jobs and organizations that like the management is learning a certain management technology as it were, and it and I understand that it's evil. It's it's like a social control type of thing, and it's like a, like Pavlov's dog type of be like behavior. Yeah, those are that's for the clueless, the middle group. See, the sociopaths already know there's bullshit. And they're gaming it, whatever system it is, you know, the Pareto or system or what, you know, whatever system. They're going to game that system and use it for their power games. But the people who believe in it are the clueless, the middle managers. See? And then the work, the workers, the lowest level, the losers, because huh? they can't win. They're locked up. That they they characterize they made a bad bargain as far as capitalism goes economics but yeah it's like, it's oh, like I have to it's like you need money right you have to live you have to have money to live so you need a job or a business and to do that you have to interface with these corporations there is no alternative even if a, if you're a farmer you know you still have to sell your stuff. So unless you have, you know, a lot of friends who need vegetables, <laughs> you have to you have to sell to a corporation. This is what all the big protests in India were about. The government was mandating and saying you have to sell to these corporations and their price controls and all like this. They get to set set the prices, not you. So fortunately, Modi backed down on that. Because the farmers were like, "Hey, we're not going to we're not going to plant anything," you know. If that's the way it is, then we don't want to be farmers anymore. It totally brings to mind like uh, Lao Tzu and um, like his ideas uh, and all that, and how that's probably never going to get implemented implemented on planet Earth anytime soon. But um, everybody yeah. would have to be enlightened. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably not going to happen. But. Yeah. It's, it's a great idea, though. It's a beautiful idea. Yeah, I guess sociopaths are here to stay. And, on, uh, on planet Earth, anyway, yeah. Yeah. See, planet <laughs> Earth is the middle planetary system. The earthly planets. And there are higher planets and there are lower planets. In the lower planets, the suffering is so overwhelming, you can't make any spiritual progress. And on the higher planets, the enjoyment 
is so overwhelming, you can't make any spiritual progress. That's why it's said, if you want to get enlightened, the best thing is to take birth on planet Earth because there's some suffering and there's some enjoyment. But it's not, neither one is so overwhelming, I mean, in the average person's life, that it's uh, not going to stop you from making spiritual progress, if that's what you want. I think you can even make spiritual progress without knowing it, too. But it's better to better to know it and better to better to I don't know try try is not not the word <laughs> but yeah no because uh, spiritual life is about consciousness it has to be conscious it can't be accidental maybe you have some good karma from a previous life and so you get association with some advanced people or something like that. But um, in general, because it's about consciousness, it has to be conscious and deliberate. What a concept. <laughs> that is the most beautiful thing. That, hey, you could change your consciousness. Like, that is a, an amazing message. You could change your consciousness. You could change your mind. You don't have to keep it. <laughs> you can change the contents of your consciousness. Consciousness itself is absolute. Consciousness never changes. In fact, it's the only thing that never changes. More precisely, awareness never changes. You're always aware. And you're, if you want to be, you're aware that you're aware. That's the doorway to enlightenment. Once you're aware that you're aware, then you realize you are different from the contents of consciousness. And even the three states of consciousness, ordinary states of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep can be objects of a higher awareness. See, I know that I'm awake, or I know that I'm dreaming, lucid dreaming, or I know that I'm in deep sleep. That's samadhi. So, yeah, consciousness is the thing. Consciousness is the, what we have to work on, but we can't work directly on consciousness because we are consciousness. It's not an object. But the contents of consciousness certainly can change, and we can certainly adjust them um, to, you know, make our thoughts more cognizant of reality. And that's what we should do. That's why we do these videos. That's why the, the scriptures were written. That's why the great teachers travel all over the world and you know, give lessons and stuff like that. To elevate the contents of people's consciousness, to create more and more impressions of higher quality in the mind, because at the end of life, when the when the whole life is rewound like a like a tape recorder and compressed into a seed, that seed becomes the uh, origin of the next life. And Krishna talks about this in Bhagavad Gita that whatever you think the state of being that you remember at the time of death, that becomes your state of being in the next life. An utterly terrifying thought. To, uh, to, uh, but it's to also the to key to liberation. <laughs> because yeah. what do you remember at the, at the point of death? You remember your entire previous life. It's called life review. Yeah. So the impressions that you have collected over the entire lifetime, the aggregate of those forms the state of being of the next life. So it's only terrifying if you haven't controlled your mind or if you haven't performed a lot of spiritual exercises and processes in this life. Yeah. 
then we yeah, are sure it would be terrifying. Because, oh my God, I'm going to remember Elvis Presley? You know, I'm going to remember all my of the job. Internet trolls, all of the times I've been trolled and Rick rolled are going to get Rick rolled back into <laughs> in my memory. <laughs> Yeah, what goes around comes around, right? I guess. I guess well, I guess. but the thing is that the karma that you create in this life doesn't manifest in this life because it becomes the seed for the next life. It's one of the misunderstandings, very common misunderstandings about karma. Yeah. Yeah, the thought like, oh, he cut me off in traffic. Uh, he's he's got it coming for him or something to that effect. <laughs> That's something else. That's, yeah. you know, that's determined by your previous life's activities. So anyway, karma is a very complicated thing. It's called Aupurusheya, which means beyond human intelligence. This is, this is how the goddess runs the universe. Not directly but by her laws, like law of karma. See, she doesn't have to individually control or judge people. They do it to themselves because of the way the universe is set up, the way the mind functions and so on. It's brilliant. Yeah, what you so, were saying before about um, changing your mind it could be it could be something, but really the observer is the observer. Consciousness is uh, the absolute. That's that's mind blowing. Yeah, I can yeah. see how I've been I've been barking up the wrong tree a lot a lot of times. <laughs> Most of us have. These are very rare insights. Yeah. People don't understand consciousness very well. That's why we I always try to bring things down to consciousness. Consciousness, consciousness, about consciousness, how things affect your consciousness. It's not about externals, except insofar as they affect your consciousness. That's the real and, truth. Yeah. And may, maybe the way you're, where you're speaking, not really your consciousness, right? As it were, uh, that's kind of just the way of speaking. But yeah, yeah. The consciousness. Yeah, I guess, yeah. That's another thing is language is the biggest trap. Knowledge is the biggest trap. The moment you try, you try to say something, it just comes out all garbled. That's why, take it. that's why I recommend study of ontology. So yeah. Ontology is the meaning of meaning. The language of languages. The science of sciences. Ontology is incredibly powerful. If you master it, oh, there's nothing you can't do. But anyways, uh, we've almost, it's almost the end of the day. The light is going away. Sunset. Yeah, let's stop off. <laughs> and uh, we've been going almost an hour now. So uh, what do you think? Are, are you okay? Yep, I'm okay. I live. I survive. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't bite. Yeah. <laughs> Not so hard, anyway. Just yeah. a little bit. <laughs> Love nibbles. <laughs> no, really. A sadhu, one of the meanings of sadhu is one who cuts. Sadhu should have a very sharp mind to cut away the delusions and the wrong understandings. It's not that he, you know, uh, sometimes sadhus can be very hard. There's a saying, as soft as a rose, as hard as a thunderbolt. That's a sadhu. Because sometimes you have to be that hard to get through to somebody. You know, of course, people make it into an ego trip and, and exploit and misuse that, you know, the, the sociopaths. Um, you joked about the, the good cop, bad cop, Upas guru and the, the nice one. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. 
Satguru. Satguru is nice. Huh? Yeah. Always blissful. Yes, yes. Very good. Upasguru is do this right now. <laughs> Both are necessary in their appropriate time. So uh, I try to be nice because if you go to the scriptures, the scriptures themselves are the hammer. You know, they're the tough guys. Yeah. Scriptures can be really, really devastating. You read these things, especially Buddha. Oh, my God. Some of the yeah. things he said, and then you think about it, and it's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> but he's a, he's a tough character, but he really, I mean, talk about compassion. Like, beyond beyond anything. So, yeah. And Buddha is very special. Okay, so I'm going to sign off now. It's been fun. Yeah, huh? especially, especially the beginning where I didn't have to do anything. I just sit back. <laughs> <laughs> you, take, you take care of yourself, and you can always ping me on Signal. If you have any questions or whatever, we can discuss. Okay? <laughs> Namaste. Om Tat Sat, Om Shakti Om.